So you guys in the recitation, um, got a preview of what's going to happen in, in, in lecture today. So we define this factorial class. We're going back to our old, boring, non-object-oriented class, you know, the Waltz class with static methods. And we had this looping factorial uh, method that went and computed the factorial using a loop. Okay? And then in your recitation, you saw this particular class. You, you, we saw that we added to it another method, and that was this recursing factorial method, which computes the factorial another way. Okay? And uh, um, I'm just curious, how many of you before this class had done some recursion? Plenty of you. That's good. Excellent. So in any recursive function, you can you say you always say there must be two kinds of steps. And what are these steps? It's a recursive method because it calls itself. But if it just called itself, you're just passing the buck. You have to have a base case also. Okay? So you have a base condition to stop it, and you have a recursive step. Okay? And mathematically, this makes sense, right? That if n is less than or equal to 1, it's 1. Otherwise, it is n multiplied by the recursive factorial of n minus 1. Okay? That's a very nice, no loop. I mean, it's easy. Once you understand recursion, this is very easy to prove. Okay? So that's another way of doing, uh, uh, doing uh, uh, factorials. And in, in, uh, those of you who did time your... Um, time the methods, which is faster, the looping or the recursive? Looping is faster, okay? It's faster, but it is harder to write, at least for me. I find recursive much easier to write, just because, you know, how would you, that's how factorials are defined. So from the definition, I've gone to the implementation. No work. Let the work be done by Java, which, you know, makes things um, a little bit more expensive. But we have to go to a very large number of computations of factorial to show you the real difference in today's computers, which are fast. So this is how people who do functional programming, they don't write loops, they just write functions like this. And in Java, you can. Okay? There's no reason why you can't do a lot of this functional programming in Java also. Okay? The point I'm, I want to make here is that there's two ways to do the same thing, and both have got these trade-offs. One, one might be easier to prove right, one might be more efficient. So I had a looping factorial spreadsheet, okay, where I had get number and a set number. And the set number was doing more than setting the number. It was also going and computing the factorial so that when I called get factorial later, I would get back the factorial for the last number I set. Okay? This is very important, by the way, for your next assignment. We're going to write a lot of bean classes. 
Okay, and if all beans were, were variables that are exported out with getters and setters, there'd be no programming. Eclipse can do that for you. Eclipse, you can tell Eclipse, these are my five variables, generate the getters and setters for them. Okay, it'll do that. But now you see that I'm, I can have a recursive factorial spreadsheet where I'm now doing set number is doing factorial, recursive factorial here. Okay, and I can have very similar code except that I go and so what's the difference between this code and previous code? Can I do a global substitution and get from the previous code this new code? So I'm using this spreadsheet right now. Okay? And if I was to tell you, okay, do something equivalent with this spreadsheet, you would go and replace all occurrences of a looping spreadsheet with a recursive spreadsheet. Okay? So I've got two classes that are more or less the same okay and that are being used here in in a very in, in in such a manner the, the the usage is so similar that i can just change one name with another name and i get the other usage okay and i did some cut and paste here essentially so won't it be nice if this code was not a copy and paste and if you could somehow capture the commonality between those two classes and how would you capture the commonality in a language I mean, I, in naming, I, I was very good. I said a looping spreadsheet, a recursive spreadsheet, so you guys can figure out from the names that there is, they're going to do the same things. But how can I capture that more formally in a language construct? Okay, something where I can assert that both of these classes are doing this, and this is something Java can define for me. have something inherited. So inheritance will give me some of this stuff. We don't quite know inheritance right now. And the trouble there is that my set number is different in the two cases. Even if I had inheritance, I couldn't capture the fact that they both have a way to set a number. Yeah. Use an interface. And uh, for somebody who doesn't know what an interface is, can you try to figure out how could I capture the commonality? So I want to get the definition of what interface means. So what is really common between these two? And the English word interface is helpful there. Yeah. The method names are similar or identical? Just the method names? So the method names followed by the arguments. And each method can be divided into a, met a header and a body. The body is within curly braces. The header is what is before curly braces. Can we say that they have the same set of method headers? Right? And an interface now would be a what? So we said the two classes implement the same interface. We already said that the two classes have the same set of method headers. So an interface must mean set of method headers with a name. Okay, so um, again, for those of you who don't know what interfaces is, supposing I have an interface called factorial spreadsheet. What would I, how would I change this class to assert that it follows that interface? Just invent invent some word. What how would I how how would I assert that? Good, interfaces that interface or implements okay that's what it says you're implementing that interface okay so method calling code remains more or the same so the public methods visible components of the two classes remain the same and by that i mean the public method header
So here's, and now you go and see, uh, oh, I got it right here. Good, I'll copy this over. Uh, so you've got, you've got now a looping factorial spreadsheet implements factorial spreadsheet. That's your assertion, okay? And you say, uh, get number, set number, you have, you have all the same stuff. And now, can you see how this code has changed besides becoming correct? I've got the names of one and two. How, how, how has this code changed in other ways? I'm initializing or I'm declaring it. I'm saying I am of this type. Okay? And it so happens that to me is assigned an instance of this class, which happens to implement this type. I'm declaring this variable to be the same type, and I'm assigning to it also a looping factorial spreadsheet. And then I can do set number two or set number seven. Yeah. Sorry, <laughs> I thought I got it right. Okay, it's lowercase, yeah. So what would be a practical implication of making an interface? Like, why would you ever want to do it? Is it just, you know, good, good programming? And, and if it's good programming, why is it good programming? Right. What, is it because the professor said so? Or is it because you're, from the inside you feel so? What do you guys think? What might be the reason to do this? To show relationship between different classes, that's one thing. You would normally put a little comment there. This class is a lot of, like that class, it's got the same methods as that. And your comment may be true or false. Who knows? You think it's true. Here I've got a Java thing which goes and says, I implement this spreadsheet. And Java will check and see whether you've implemented every method there or not. So you, you'll always be true. Otherwise Java will say you're false. so that you don't have to repeat your code, okay? I can go and when I'm writing as a programmer, I don't care, you know, whether you're looping or, or, or fact. Once, it's, once the object has been created, I don't care. It's one way or the other. Today, I might have a recursive spreadsheet. Tomorrow, I might go and assign to the same variable another spreadsheet, and I can use the variable in very similar ways, and it doesn't matter. So you can change your mind, okay? So you don't care who really comes to teach you, right? As, as long as they go and teach you 401. So as long as I implement the interface of a professor of 401, I can be replaced by another guy and it doesn't matter. As long as you guys are all implementing the interface required from a 110 student, it doesn't matter whether which version of 110 you took. So I can just assume you speak Jap English I don't, and, and, you know, or you speak 110 and that's enough. Okay, there were some other hands up. Why do you say invisible? Because the user never sees it. The user sees the interface only. The user doesn't see the class. The user is saying, I have a factorial spreadsheet, the interface. And I'm going to call... So, so here's the fundamental question. Why do we type variables? How many of you have done Python? Do you type variables in Python? That's why it's so good, right? Superfluous. Typing is superfluous. Python proves it. Maybe. And why do we type exactly? What, I mean, there's pros and cons. You can, you know, the Python is used in a lot of startups. They have few resources. They've got to get the job done. They're not going to, you know, they're not going to waste their time writing a type name. Okay? So basically, when you type, you say, these are the operations you can, you can, you can invoke on me. You can ask me a question, anything about 110, hopefully I'll answer. You can ask me anything about 401, I'll answer. Okay, so when I become a 401 professor, there's some guarantees being given. And if you don't type, what will happen? Somebody will come in and they say, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know, because at runtime, if you figure out they don't know this. At, at, when I was assigned to be a professor, at that point, there was no assertion that I know these things. Okay, 
So what happens in Python if you call a method that doesn't exist in that object? I don't know what happens in Python, but in Smalltalk, which was sort of the motivation of Python, it says message not understood. Okay, it says method not understood. Sorry, you called a method that I don't understand because no checking was done at compile time when I was assigned to the thing. So when I go and say this factorial one is of type factorial spreadsheet, then I go and say set number. I, the set number is legal because it was defined by, it was in which if, set number is legal because, because, because it was in the class looping factorial spreadsheet or because it was the interface factorial spreadsheet. Interface. That's all Java knows. All Java knows is that the type of factorial one is factorial spreadsheet. It only checks for those methods. So the class is the one that's invisible. The interface is what is visible. That's the whole point. We want, we want people to see fewer visible things and have more things invisible. Just as your variables in a class that are not public are hidden. They are invisible. Now you're saying the class itself is invisible and just the interface is visible. Yeah. So you're saying when, when we go and call the method set number, it goes first to the interface, from the interface to the class? Actually, the interface is mainly a compi compile time thing. Then it goes directly to the class. Okay? So it's not less efficient. Okay? And you're going to see a lot of examples as, as you program more that will show you why you want this late binding. This is called late binding. You don't want to go and uh, bind too quickly the type of a variable and say it is a factorial spreadsheet. Who knows, today I might have it recursive, tomorrow I might have it looping. I don't want my program to change when I go and decide I want this implementation or that implementation. Okay? Questions? Yeah. So in Eclipse, what do you do? You go and say new class, right? When you go in, 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 if you're just doing bare bones environment, you just create a file name and you go and put the word public interface or just interface and it, you know, depending on whether you want it public or not, and it says it's an interface. But if you're using Eclipse, you go and use a menu that says new interface rather than new class. Okay? You can say new class, it'll put, create the word, put the word class in, you can replace the class word with interface and that'll also work. A formal definition of interface was? A set of method headers with a name. Okay. Okay, so we are using interfaces as types, and that is after assignment three and onwards, you are not allowed to create classes without interfaces. Okay, every instance method must be in some interface. And every variable must be typed as an interface type and not as a uh, class type. Okay? Yeah. Is the interface, is the interface kept in a dot .java file? Or yes. Code? Okay. Dot .java file. Okay, so you're creating a class instance assigning to a factorial. Okay. And I have now another... I really messed around. Okay, yeah, this is fine, actually. Uh, another implementation of same interface, and we are saying a recursive factorial spreadsheet also implements the same interface. And now I'm assigning a recursive factorial spreadsheet to factorial 2, and I can say factorial 1 is assigned factorial 2 because they're the same type. That's, again, you're getting more flexibility in your program. Because Java knows that they implement the same interface, you can go and um, assign to um, a variable that held an instance of a looping factorial spreadsheet, now an instance of a recursive factorial spreadsheet. Okay? I've got an analogy a little later, which will make this a little bit clearer. Okay, so factorial spreadsheet, the variable can be assigned any, an instance of any class that implements that interface. Okay, it makes it easier to switch implementations. That's sort of one way. The other is it's a very good form of documentation saying these two classes are doing the same thing Okay, and, and that same thing happens to be 
implementing the same set of methods. Okay, maybe this will make it clearer. So, do you guys remember a factory was like a class? A car produced by a factory was like an instance. Okay, you could go invoke operations on the factory itself. Those were your static methods. You could invoke methods on the instances. Those were your instance methods. That's why you cannot invoke an instance method directly on a class or an interface. Okay? Can you figure out what it would mean in this picture, in this world of factories? And, and, and objects, what interface might mean? Yeah. Maybe a, line. Uh, a what? A standard, line. a standard assembly line or a standard. So that would be kind. That's yeah. That yeah. That's that's one way to define it. Some kind of standard. Specification. A specification. It's not quite telling you how to do things. <coughs> it's telling you when you make an Acura or a. Uh, it, you must make a car of this kind. You make an. Uh, do they still make Integras? I forget. Uh, but you make a particular model of a car. This is what you should follow. Okay. So two different factories that follow the same specification are basically two classes implementing the same interface. And in real world, we care more about what kind of car it is rather than what factory produced. Okay? And each factory might have its own rules. And yes, you might hear from the grapevine that uh, this factory produces cars with fewer errors than another car. Okay? That's not supposed to happen. So, so this, particular fa this particular car class may be more efficient, maybe more error prone, who knows. Okay? But when you know how to use one car, you know how to use another car. And if your car is recalled, you can be replaced, it can be replaced with another car from another factory. And you can't complain. Okay? That is the motivation, essentially, in programming. Okay, to be minus the constructor, just the non-constructor methods. They don't ever they don't ever commit the interface to some particular class. Okay, so this is just another example of the same thing. And you see here that this is a contract, and we are basically checking that everything that 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 the method header matches, other than the names of the parameters. Names of parameters never matter to Java. Because we use positional correspondence, okay. So, that, so that's what re it really um, it means in real. Re uh, when you say you implement an interface, that's your contract, okay. So, nothing new here. Just another example to give you a little bit more practice with interfaces, okay. And if this doesn't, if you don't do this, Java will complain. So, this, this and it'll tell you exactly what what's wrong. So. Uh, in using interfaces is pretty easy, actually. Okay, um, again, to make things more concrete, so um, we saw two ways to do factorials. Whenever you, whenever you have more than one way to do something, interfaces are particularly compelling. Okay, now my, uh, my BMI spreadsheet here is implementing this particular interface, and I'm going to claim it's implementing it in a particular way. And that there's more than one way to implement this interface. Can you guys see how you might be a little different? And let's just see how this way is. I have two variables. I go and set my, my and my get BMI returns the value, a value computed from these two variables. And, and that's the implementation. Can you imagine another implementation that has the same interface, has the same behavior? Yeah. You might have an implementation that stores the BMI. Okay, in which case my my uh, my set weight and set height would do what? Where when would the value be stored? It's still a read-only value. You can't go and set. No matter what my weight and height is, this is my BMI. You know that is not allowed. That would be nice. Okay, but the BMI has to be a read-only property. So when is the value assigned to the property? To the third, that extra variable. 
set weight and set height to it. Okay. So I have another BMI spreadsheet and now I have BMI in a variable. My get BMI returns that value and now my set height and set weight are like my set number before. They not only set the value, but they do some extra things also. They compute the values of, of, of the BMI, which can be retrieved from get BMI. Okay. So I have two different ways of doing things united by a common interface. Okay. And we'll start from here next time. Okay, questions? Questions? No questions? Okay. Um, uh, so you have uh, another assignment due this Friday. And uh, I see the class is thinned down, at least a little bit here, uh, on Sakai. It's thinned down by about 10, 15 students. Uh, 170 students submitted the first assignment. I assume you guys are still there. Uh, so I kind of warned you that, look, if you, if you have trouble doing the first assignment, uh, maybe you don't belong in the class. Okay? Uh, but let me say that if you did finish the first assignment one way or the other, uh, you have the ability to finish the class now. The question really is how much time you can allocate, okay? And do other courses get in the way? Because you will have an assignment every week, okay? Um, but uh, now you should feel comfortable uh, since if you've done the first assignment. Because if you've done the first assignment, the second one is not that different or more difficult. Maybe it's a little bit more work, um, but it's possible. It's doable, okay? So no questions on the assignment, no questions on what we did last time? Okay, so you're saying there are two ways to get the same output. There's part one and part two. Okay. And do you want me to, do you want, if you do part two, do you still have to do part one? Okay. And if, the, if that's the question, no. If you do part two, part one is assumed. Part, part two is more than part one. And I said on, as I said on Piazza, only one set of screen dumps is enough. Okay. Other questions? Okay. And, you know, if you guys don't quite understand why I'm asking certain things, that's okay. You, you're not looking ahead as I am. Okay, you might have understood why we did the first assignment. But, again, that's not directly related to what you're going to do in, the, do, in, do in your project. And we're going to build on things you did here. And I have to balance a lot of things, including how much work I give you every week. So I could have made the bean class more complicated, but I didn't. But you'll do that in the next assignment. Okay. Um, so we were looking at interfaces and your assignment number three will involve the use of interfaces. Um, and let's understand them properly. Um, you know, it seems that, you know, I'm going to ask you to do two kinds of things, produce a certain kind of user interface, a certain kind of behavior. And once you understand the behavior, you say, okay, I know what is expected. I know how I, I know when I'm done. Okay. But I'm also going to put constraints on you and say, go and do, use these programming constraints. Define a bean, use a bean class. Okay? Define interfaces. Now, that part you might think is harder because uh, it requires you to know more things. But once you know those things, applying them is easy. It's almost a formula. It's almost boring. Okay? So, but, but knowing those concepts is the hard part. Okay, so what a bean is, is very simple. I mean, you know, we derive that in class. You just have to sort of remember that and internalize it. And that's something, those of you who are relying on your one, uh, programming skills in the previous class and your programming knowledge in the previous class are finding it difficult now because you say, wait a minute, I've got to learn something new. Well, that's the idea, right? So, um, so I see particularly questions from people who know too much, uh, that, that, uh, which show that they're confused because they just expect uh, to know everything. You, ha you haven't learned everything in the previous class. And, and, and interfaces is another kind of concept that 
you might have learned in a, and it might have been motivated in a very different fashion than the way I'm motivating or even explained. So that's something you have to learn. But once you learn it, it's, it's trivial almost to apply it. Okay? So your next assignment should be easy uh, as long as you understand the concept. Okay? And the concept is that a stretch, uh, an interface is a set of method headers. And so it's basically a class without any implementation. Okay? So it's basically the specification for the class. Okay? And it's not for the class. You can have more than one class implementing the same interface. And that's partly why we want interfaces. Okay? And we saw that from a BMI spreadsheet. We created two different kinds of BMI spreadsheets. Then we said, let's somehow unite them together. Let's go and tell somebody who's looking at our code there's something common among, between these two classes. And you can go and put comments in. But comments are in English. They can't be understood by or verified by Java. So what we did was we said, OK, we'll have a new construct concept called interface. And we'll say both classes implement the same interface. And as the word interface implies, it is, it is, it is sort of a boundary. It's, 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 it's a surface through which you go into some, uh, you use, an ax, uh, use a, some object. And, and in terms of the car analogy, it's the controls you use to drive the car. And it hides the implementation from you. OK? Um, and we saw one, one implementation of a, a spreadsheet, BMI spreadsheet that had two variables. It had, it, had, it, had, it had three properties. Okay, Again, get this clear that you know, property is not equal to variable. It had three properties. One of them was read-only. That read-only property was not stored in any variable. And, um, and, and so that was one way to do things. That means every time you call get BMI, you do some computation. And we saw that's not the only way to do implement this interface. And we saw another one. And in this one, we had three variables. And your get BMI just return the value of BMI, assuming it's correctly computed. And it is correctly computed every, each, always, because every time you change something, it depends on like height or, or weight, the BMI value is recomputed. OK? OK. So what I've described to you now um, can be uh, what, what we've studied so far can be described using some diagrams. This almost looks like a biology diagram. We are doing classification. Okay, and we have two kinds of arrows. One is an instance of arrow, and the other is an implements arrow. Okay, these are describing relationships between the various concepts we are studying here. Okay, so we saw there were classes. We started with classes. We saw that classes could just have static methods, in which case they're kind of boring. They're the conventional procedural way of doing programming. Or they could be types, which means they have instance methods, instance variables which means they can be instantiated, okay? And when they're instantiated, what you create are objects or instances. And so we have a BMI spreadsheet instance, and we have another instance that's also an object of type BMI spreadsheet. Uh, this might be a really dumb question, but could you just give a quick example of an instance variable? Right, we just saw the height and weight in the BMI spreadsheet was an instance variable. Okay. Remember, instance variables are global variables that are accessible to all methods, instance methods in a class, okay? And they are not static variables, which means they are dynamically created each time. Yeah, you're trying to instantiate the class. We saw last time in the memory diagram, okay, that you create a new set of values, variables, and slots in memory for that, okay? So, and again, with the analogy of car, when you, when, you, uh, when you drive a car from a factory, when you get a, get a car from the factory, you get your own mileometer, right? Everybody's got their own mileometer saying how far the car has driven. It's not as if that's a static variable in the factory saying how far the car, car has gone, okay? But the number of cars produced is something that's perhaps kept in the factory because it's not specific to an instance, okay? So that's an instance, and... We've got another BMI spreadsheet, which also happens to be a class, and we have its instances. Okay, so that's those are these arrows, and then we have these arrows here that say that this particular class implements this interface. Okay, so BMI spreadsheet and another BMI spreadsheet, both implement BMI spreadsheet the interface. Okay, so we have a relationship between an instance and a class, and a class and an interface. Is there a relationship between an instance and an interface? Can you derive 
new uh, can we derive new kinds of relationships based on these two relationships can we somehow combine these relationships in some way So instant, if, if uh, uh, an object is an instance of a class, you can invoke the methods that are defined in the class? Okay. So if you really think about what an instance really means, instance means that I, your, an object is an instance of, instance of some type T if all the methods in that type can be invoked on that object. Okay. So when an, when, when, when an object is an instance of this, this class, all the instance methods in the, define, in the class can be invoked on this particular object. And that's also true about all the methods in the interface. So then I would say a BMI, what's the relationship between a BMI spreadsheet instance and a BMI spreadsheet, the interface? So BMI spreadsheet instance is an instance of the class. What would you say is a relation? And we said instance of your instance of some type, some type if all the methods in the type can be invoked on you. Can all the methods in the interface be invoked on the object? Yeah? Because the class implements those methods. So you can say that a BMI spreadsheet instance is an instance of all uh, the interface. Okay, so if I say a BMI spreadsheet new BMI spreadsheet, instance of a BMI spreadsheet, is that going to be true or false? We saw the instance of operation last time, right? True. True? We saw, I think we defined that this Java has this instance of, right? We saw that, so this is not an instance of a factorial spreadsheet, but it's an instance of this. And, and the second one, is that true? Okay, based on what we just said. And the third one, okay. So, if class or interface of object O is T, then O is an instance of T, returns true. Okay, so that's basically the idea. Or the more generally, if, um, if all the methods of some type T, like I said, can be invoked on an object, then that object is an instance of that interface, that type. And what does that mean? That means that we can use interfaces to type. And we saw that earlier last time. But we can not only type an object or an instance using a class, but also we can type it using an interface. Okay? So I can assign to BMI spreadsheet an instance of a BMI spreadsheet. Okay? Because an instance of a BMI spreadsheet is an instance of also the interface BMI spreadsheet, right? So we can create a new, so that, that's true, that's fine. And I can go and do a get BMI afterwards. And I can then, this is the interesting thing, that because I've typed the variable using an interface, I can assign to it another BMI spreadsheet instance, okay? Because that variable can be assigned instances of both classes. Instances of both classes are also instances of that interface, okay? So you can, this is like, again, the car analogy, that if you, are, if, you are, if you are a car that was manufactured in the factory in this city, the Accord factory in this city versus an Accord factory in another city, it doesn't make a difference because you are an Accord, okay? You are following the specification that both factories follow, okay? So you never go and say it's this factory object. You always say it's this kind of object, okay? So that's the analogy here. And, and, and we saw last time that types are used to make sure that you invoke the right methods on an object. And, as, and so you can, you can call get BMI because get BMI is defined in BMI spreadsheet. Okay? So interface is type, and you're storing uh, the same variable assigned instances of two different classes. Okay? So can I say obtain BMI here?
Okay, I can't do that because it's not defined in the interface. Okay. okay, I could do get BMI because get BMI is in the interface. What if I keep get BMI in the class and I remove it from the interface? So it's in the class. To BMI spreadsheet, I've assigned an instance of this particular class. This class has the get BMI method in it. But I removed it from the interface. Why is that illegal? It's in the class. Because this variable has been typed using BMI spreadsheet. So what could go wrong? In this case, I mean, the get BMI method is there. It's like you got some part, you got some extra feature in a factory. It's there. I'm not letting you use it because I labeled it as a cord. Okay. But it's there in this case. So what in general could go wrong if I looked at not the interface methods, but the class methods instead? And why would you get a compiler error? Because <laughs> in, in the interface. Yeah. So because I went and typed it using BMI spreadsheet, this variable at compile time, we don't know what values it might be assigned to. It's a variable. It can change values. It's not a final variable. So, so we don't know. Um, in this particular case, it won't be reassigned. But in general, a variable could be reassigned a value. And it could be assigned a value that, um, that, that, uh, that is of a class that doesn't implement get BMI. Okay? So for that reason, uh, it's going to uh, give a compiler error. Because at compile time, we don't know. Okay? So not defined in interface, so illegal, even though defined in class. Okay, let's see whether we really understand interface and why they exist by looking at this code. I have this print method. It takes one argument of who's, which is typed by a class. Okay, so I told you we shouldn't type variables using classes. That's a no-no. <coughs> to better give an idea why that's a no-no, let's go and do something wrong and see what could go wrong. Okay, so I've typed uh, this variable using the class, in which case I can call get height, get weight, get BMI because they're all defined in the class. Now, could I go and say print new BMI spreadsheet, given the way the print is defined? Will my type checking rules allow me to do new BMI spreadsheet? Is this value of the type expected here? No? Yes? So there are two examples. I can say new BMI spreadsheet or I can say new another BMI spreadsheet. Okay, so this is the print method. It's expecting a BMI spreadsheet, this particular instance. And I'm calling it here. And at compile time, are these statements legal? Sorry? So which one is legal, which one is not? Or both illegal? Or both, Ill both are illegal? Why are both illegal? So I'm passing to this variable this value. So I am passing a value. The question is, is this value of the type expected here? Is a new another BMI spreadsheet instance of a, a BMI spreadsheet? Is a new BMI spreadsheet instance of a BMI spreadsheet? Okay, yeah. So that would be wrong. That one. So if I really want to print an instance of another BMI spreadsheet, what do I have to do? If I'm going to type using class variables, I have to copy and paste. Okay? The code here is identical, except that it goes and takes as an argument a value of type another BMI spreadsheet. Okay? What I've done is defined an overloaded method. Okay? And we've seen that overloaded methods are good in the sense that you can... Uh, 
uh, use the same name for to uh, to, uh, to perform an operation, but it, but you see that I copied and pasted, and now if if I'm given only this method, this would be illegal. Okay, so basically my print method doesn't depends only on the interface of that class. It doesn't depend on how it's implemented. The class is implemented, so why type it using the class when you type it using the interface? Because the interface gives you uh, more flexibility. Okay. So. What I could do instead is type it using the interface, in which case, can I pass another BMI spreadsheet? Because there's an instance of BMI spreadsheet. We saw that. That's why the instance of operation is important. Can I pass a BMI spreadsheet instance? I, yes, because again, it's an instance. Okay? So this kind of method is called, rather than an overloaded method, it's called a polymorphic method. And a method is polymorphic, and you get from this example, can you say a method is a method is overloaded when you have two different implementations uh, of the method, and they both have the same. So a method named F is overloaded if there are two implementations that whose name, name, names are F. A method is polymorphic if it is. It's kind of like overloaded. You can pass arguments of different types, but to handle arguments of different types, you need not one method, but uh, not multiple methods, but one method. Okay. So, any, anybody heard the term polymorphism in your previous class? One person? In the context of inheritance, perhaps? So, this is also applies in the context of interfaces. The whole idea is that you can have a method that, uh, that works on instances of different classes. And that's what this, this does. So polymorphic method is a method having at least one parameter that can be assigned objects of different classes. Okay? So this is a polymorphic method. And by typing using interfaces, you, you, you allow someone to write polymorphic methods. Okay? Yeah, so we had, in the previous slide, we had two. Okay, let's confuse things a little bit more. Anybody see a difference between this class and the classes I've def def uh, defined earlier? Yeah? Oh, I don't have an interface name. That's good. Because I'm confused. Okay, yeah. It has a method, calculate BMI. Okay, it, rather than make, making the computation, so rather than co computing once here and once here, the same formula, I go and put that formula in this method so that if I later change the formula and want to use some other units, 
okay, I want to use uh, feet in pound, uh, then I can, inches in pound, I could go and just change my calculate BMI. I don't have to change two different places. Yeah. Oh, I, okay, yeah, that happens a lot to me. Sometimes I just uh, skip it because it doesn't fit on my slide. You know, how I, how I code often depends on what I can put on a slide. Okay, so that's good. Thank you. Yeah. I'm also trying to implement. Okay, so that I'm confused about. So that's what I'm going to help ask. You know, I need your help here. Okay. And so, so the main point is, the main change I made is that I've, I've gone and taken this computation that was repeated in set height and set weight and put that in a function, which is a very good thing to do. I put that in a method. I made that method public. Is that a good thing to do also, make the method public? Sorry? <laughs> you just want to, don't want to type too much, right? So you say, just don't make too many things public so that I don't have to type it in the interface. You're going to make it protected, you know, even more than, more than. So you guys know private, you know protected. I don't know that right now. Okay, so we'll come to it at some point. But, you know, you want to make things public. I guess when you guys go on Facebook, you have to think, right? What am I going to make public? What am I going to make private? And I'm amazed that your generation is focusing on not making things public. Uh, but, uh, but yes, that's always a good question. So public is something that you don't mind exposing. That's not part of the implementation. And uh, yeah, if I'm going to change my mind about how calculate BMI is, what units are going to be used, I should make it non-public. Okay? But if I'm pretty sure about the units, then why not make it public just because somebody else might want to just do calculate BMI. They may not want to create a spreadsheet. They may not want to go and do, you know, set height or weight but they just want the calculate, calculate BMI method for its own sake. It's an independent method. It's a useful method to calculate the BMI given two values. Okay, so why not make it public and let somebody else use that functionality also? Okay, that's part of what you want to do. You sure, you have to go and put it in the interface. Then that's like saying, don't add this feature to the card because I have to write it down. Okay? Yes, it is a pain to write things down. I agree 100%. But I think if you're going to make money out of the feature, you... You, you put the feature in, yeah. Yes, okay, so that's a very good point, okay? That should you make that a static method? And if I made it a static method, I wouldn't be able to prove the point I want to prove. And more importantly, static methods cannot appear in interfaces, okay? And that's one reason to not create static methods even though they could be static. And the reason why it's, it's a candidate for a static method is because it does not depend on any instant state. So it's a perfect candidate for a static, static method. It's just that uh, they can't be in interfaces. And why are they not in interfaces? That's a good question. Uh, you know, James Gosling, the inventor of Java, just made that decision. And I think he made that decision mainly because he wants to discourage static methods in general. Okay? So he just said we put thing, only, only uh, static, uh, non-static methods in interface. Okay, so but that's that's a very good point. Okay, and if you want if you want certain kinds of efficiencies, you will make it a static method. Okay, there's a little trade-off. It either goes in the interface or it is efficient. Okay, so I've decided I want to put it in a public method, and now we are going to have to put it in some interface. So we have to do the paint work, and more importantly, we have to make a decision which interface should we put it in. And that is why I put question marks here saying, I don't know. Okay? We do have a BMI spreadsheet interface. Should we put it in that interface, perhaps? If we put it in that interface, that means all implementations of that interface must have this method. But this method is kind of separate. It's a calculation method. It's not changing the state. It's, it's something we decided to put, but maybe we don't want to put it. Maybe other implementations needn't put it. Okay? So uh, it's, it's just putting, you know, it's like saying this particular factory is, is, is adding this feature, and then we require all other factories to also add this feature. And, and so maybe that's not such a great idea, because then we are, we are especially when that doesn't belong, 
with the rest of the interface methods. So if it's not going to be in that interface, what should we do? Yeah. Okay, so could we implement two interfaces? Yes. Could I have an interface that portrays me as a professor and could I have another one that is just a UNC employee, another one that is an English speaking person? In reality, yes, right? So I could perhaps have two interfaces. And you think Java will allow you to implement more than one interface? Should it, based on the argument we just gave? And it does, okay? And, and look what I called it. I called it a BMI spreadsheet and calculator. I didn't call it a BMI spreadsheet. I'm saying, look, I'm doing more. I've, I'm, I, have, I have more than one aspect. Okay? I have more than one role I can play. Okay? So that's the difference of the question. This interface is pretty straightforward okay and if this was a static method I couldn't have put it there okay questions okay so this raises all kinds of issues okay so now I can have a BMI calculator that implements only that interface the BMI calculator interface so I can just have a standalone thing that does the BMI calculation and I needn't have um, and my, my another VMI spreadsheet needn't implement that interface. Okay. Okay, so now let's go and see which of these are true. Is a BMI instance of BMI spreadsheet and calculator instance of that class? Okay. Is it an instance of BMI spreadsheet? Is that instance of BMI calculator? For the same reason? Huh? So that should be true. Okay. Uh, is it an instance of a BMI calculator, the class? False. Why? Because the BMI calculator is the, is the class, and these are two different classes. That, that are not related in any way to inheritance, which we'll still see later. And is it an instance of a BMI spreadsheet? Okay. So that's, you understand now a little bit more of type checking and instance of. Okay. Instance of is very important for type checking.
Okay, so this is something that comes up a lot when you implement multiple interfaces. <laughs> so I created two instances of BMI spreadsheet and calculator. Now my rule says that you should always type variables using, uh, using interfaces. Okay? So I either have to use BMI calculator or I have to use BMI spreadsheet as, 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 a, as the type. Okay? So in one case, I made the instance and assigned the instance to a variable of type BMI calculator. Okay, so having multiple interfaces, going back to the car analogy, you know, we can say a car is characterized by its make, by its license plate, by its registration. So there are multiple interfaces it has. And uh, different people want to treat the car in different ways. And so, you know, whether it's registered or not, whether it's this kind of car or not. So um, that's basically what it means to have more than one interface for a class. Okay? Questions? So you can't just go buy this something from, you can't just take a specification and convert that into a car. You have to go to a factory and get a car from there. Okay? Similarly, you can't just go and say new interface. Because then the question becomes, which, which implementation do you want? Okay, the interface has no implementation. So you cannot uh, instantiate interface, you must instantiate class. So you always instantiate a class and assign that value to some variable of some type, which is an interface. Okay? So all of this, you, you know, you'll, you'll learn in more depth when you do your next assignment, not the current assignment, but that's, that's, that's what's going to happen. Okay, so we said, oh, an interface is like a specification. You, you follow these. If you implement this specification, you're doing good. Okay? And the question is, how good? So if rather than having this get BMI method return weight divided by height star height, what if I just returned this value? Is this class still implementing that interface? Okay, it's implementing, it's got the get, it's got the get BMI method. Okay, it's not doing the thing right thing, what you expect, but it's still got the get BMI method. So you know, just because you implement the interface doesn't mean you've done it right, okay? And, you know, maybe, so this is a syntactic contract. Somehow the names are meaningful to the programmer, and these names are being used to go and um, uh, convey meaning, okay? And sometimes the same name can convey multiple meanings, okay? So you have to be a little careful. I'm not saying that you don't have any comments ever, okay? Sometimes you do, might want to disambiguate things. But, but implementing an interface is better than not implementing an interface. But just because you're, you say this class implements this interface doesn't mean necessarily that you have gone and um, uh, removed the need for comments okay, or, and remove the need for doing things correctly. Okay? Okay, um, let's again, you know, we're going to do a lot of interfaces, so let's understand this concept in real depth. So what did we do? If you remember how we derived this, we came up with the BMI spreadsheet class as one of the examples. And then we went and said, oh, there's more than one way to implement this functionality. We, you know, rather than having two variables, let's have three variables. And we came up with another class. And then we said, how can we go and unite these classes? And we could come and came up with an interface. Okay? So that's bottom up, very opportunistic. It says, you know, I just have got these two things that are similar. Let's go and unite them. And that's how often programming happens. Okay, in fact, in Java, they, that's what happened. They had a class called Vector, which did not implement an interface. Many years later, they said, you know what? That's not the only way to do a list. Let's also have something called ArrayList. And they said, well, ArrayList and Vectors are kind of doing the same thing. So let's go and define a list interface and have both classes implement that interface. Okay? So that's how basically the list interface got created for those of you who might have used the list interface in your previous class. Okay? But, you know, a lot of lawyers, lot of you know, they go and argue that we should really, really start with the interface first and then come up with the implementation. And, and yes, that's possible sometimes. And here's an example where that might be possible for us. 
Okay, so we are modeling something that we really know and understand from our previous classes. And we want to model it using the computer. And um, we want to represent a mathematical point. And in mathematics, a point can be represented, you know, by its x and y coordinates, by it is, its radius and angle. Okay? So how might you define, if I told you go and, and we, have to, we have to deal with geometry in your project, right? So if I was to tell you, give me an interface for this particular abstract concept, what might the interface look like? So you would have a method again. Say that for for x. Uh, basically, you could call well, maybe not like that, but basically, you could have a way to set it as x, y, or r theta and read it. As okay, so that's what you want abstractly. If somebody was to, was to write it in English and they know nothing about Java, they would say, "We want to go and allow you to set." And and that's something to be negotiated. The the, the point is as 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 as, a, as the Cartesian coordinates or polar coordinates. But what exact methods would I have then after that? So you would have one method for x and y together, yep. one method for, R and, theta. and one method to, yeah, x and y. how do I get x and y? What? How do I get x and y back in, as one value? Um, return an array. <laughs> return an array. <laughs> okay, so that becomes a little issue. Yeah. Okay. And do I always want to set X and Y together? Maybe I can set, you know, X. But these are all decisions to be made. Okay, now you see why programming is fun. It's an art also, because there's more than one way to do the same thing. Okay? Maybe I have one method to set, set them both, and maybe I have separate methods to get them. Okay? Or maybe I have, I have separate methods, methods to set each of them also. And if I do that, I'll be following the bean conventions and define properties. And properties can be understood by external tools. Okay? What you said is fine too. Is that okay? And 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 after this, you can implement that interface. And at this point, I've got a constructor, and I've got two constructors. One constructor that goes and takes the Cartesian values, another constructor that takes the polar values, and it does some magical mathematical uh, computations to go and convert. And and so what it does is, its instance variables store. I'm calling it a Cartesian point because so it's an implementation of a point, and I'm calling it a Cartesian point. Even though the constructor takes both Cartesian coordinates and, I mean, I have two different constructors, one that takes Cartesian coordinates, one that takes polar point coordinates, yet I'm calling this a Cartesian point. It stores the Cartesian values and it computes the other values. Okay? And another alternative would be 
a polar point which stores the polar values and computes the Cartesian <coughs> coordinates. And now you see again so many choices I have. Okay? And this is, this is why like, I, I emphasize that you know, programming becomes an art. Okay? Not only do you have to choose your variable names properly, but you have to do a much you know, broader kind of thing too. Okay? And this all has to do with what's called representation. That given some abstract concept that you have to implement in, in code, you have to choose how that concept is represented. And in choosing the representation, you have to do two, make two kinds of choices. First, what kind of interface you're going to have, and then given an interface, what kind of implementation of the interface you want. Yes, that was convenient. That the two coordinates would, and if they were both ends, we would be in trouble. Okay, and 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 that's where constructors get into trouble. Okay, that. Okay, so what if I had two constructors, both of which took two int arguments? What would Java do? At what point? When you call the constructor? It could, it would complain at the point at which you call the constructor, or it could complain when? At compile time. That's when it'll complain. It says, you know, at compilation, I found two methods with the same parameters. <laughs> Look, at runtime, I won't know which one to choose. So let's go and uh, not allow you to do that. Okay? So again, when we say representation of an abstract concept, you have to first choose the interface. Are we going to have a set with two parameters? Or are we going to have no set? Are we going to have a set with one parameter? That's the interface. And then after the interface, you have to say, okay, I'm going to use Cartesian coordinates or... Uh, polar coordinates, I'm going to store all four variables. Okay, so all these choices you have to make. Okay, some are more efficient in certain situations. Some are more time efficient, which means they run faster. Some are more space efficient, in which case they use less memory. So which, some of these things you probably have heard of, uh, have seen in your previous classes. Okay? Questions? So what's a representation? Uh, I thought I defined that before, but here, here it is again. So defined by its interface, specifies properties, and physical representation defined by its instance variables. Okay? And a Cartesian point and polar point are the same logical representation, which means they are, they are logically the same interface, but physically they are different objects. Okay? Okay, and... Okay, we understand points. Lines are a little bit more complicated. And what are some ways to represent a line? Yeah. Start point and end point. Any other way? Yeah. And a vector. Okay, any other way? Lots of ways. Okay. And we're going to do it this way. Uh, we've got a start point, and we have the size of the bounding rectangle, okay, which is a rectangle containing the diagonal. So we have height and width of that rectangle. And that's what I'm going to choose, and that's what, when you draw your lines, you, you, you'll be doing. And anybody, can anybody guess why I chose this? I mean, how do you, you know, it's, it's, if I was to, represent a rectangle, would I have the same properties? As long as I know it's a rectangle, I'd have again a point and the bounding rectangle. If I was to represent oval, I can again use the bounding box. So the bounding box idea is very general. It applies to many kinds of shapes. And so that's, that's why I'm using this. Okay, there's nothing sacred about it, uh, except that it's, 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 it's convenient in a uniform way. But Java, when it makes you draw a line, it actually says two endpoints. So this is being a little different from the way Java does things. Okay, and now I can define my line interface. And in this time, this here, I'm just defining the interface. I'm not defining the implement. Well, I guess I have the implementation next. But now I have both get getters and setters. And because I don't want to create new lines, those, those are big objects. I don't mind creating new points, so I can make them immutable. But lines are a little bit more heavyweight, so I'm having setters also. So the setters are pretty obvious from uh, from properties. 
And here's my implementation. And I have the a constructor that takes um, the coordinates in the bounding box. Now, if I wanted another constructor that took two endpoints, I'd be in trouble. Okay? Because those, those would also be ints, and I wouldn't be able to define that constructor. Okay? But, uh, so I'd have, have to use setter methods in that case. But that's my implementation. Okay? So you've seen lots of bean classes, and you've seen a lot of examples here. Factorial storer, BMI spreadsheets, BMI storer, point, line, and so forth. Questions? Okay, so interfaces define contracts between our users and implementers. Uh, I don't know why I say, use the word users here. I guess users of a class, not end users, but users of a class and the implementers of the class. Okay, they're both programmers. Next, we're going to look at user interface, which is different. And they are optional to do the job. You didn't need to use interfaces, but you might end up writing, duplicating code. You might end up doing a lot of other things. And, and it is good style to use them. Okay? And again, I've, I've been around in, long enough to see Java gradually transform more and more things, more and more classes into, uh, that didn't implement interfaces into those that implement interfaces. And they've learned it the hard way. And I'm just saying that, look, at least in this class, you know, just, just always use interfaces. They'll come in handy later in the project. And just get used to doing them. And, and later, when you understand better what your programs are going to do, uh, you may or may not use them. But I recommend you use them. And there are times when I don't use them also when I'm in a hurry. And I say, who's going to define an interface? And I always have to pay far more, in far more work later. So it's really a stitch in time kind of situation. Okay? And we all tend, when we have deadlines, we all look, you know, get the thing that gives you an immediate benefit rather than what gives you a long-term benefit. Uh, but these do give you long-term benefits. Okay? And interfaces in reality can be derived top-down or bottom-up. Okay? And, and we've seen both. That in the BMI spreadsheet case, we derive them bottom-up. Bottom up, but in the point case, we derive top-down. Okay? Okay. Um, so... Every time you define a new kind of concept, you have to name that, that object also. And what have I, what's the formula I've been using so far? That given an interface name, the class name is some qualifier preceding the interface name. Okay, and, and when I didn't have any other qualifier, I just said A. A BMI spreadsheet. And when I came up with another one, I said another. Okay. Or you can be more, you can be more descriptive and say a space efficient, uh, or just space efficient, okay? So some kind of qualification before interfaces. Anybody who's used interfaces before seen another way of naming things? Yeah. Okay. So you have you uh, you have the, you begin with a class name, say C, and you call its interface. I see. Right? So you start with the class name and derive from that the interface name. Uh, so, by the way, that's, that's another way of doing this. You can say interface qualified IMPL. And here's the other one. You begin with the class name and say interface or I. Okay? And so you say BMI spreadsheet interface. Now, which... Which scheme do you like? Deriving the class from the interface name or deriving the interface from the class? If you're going to have multiple implementations of an interface, you, you know, then it makes sense to have the interface come first and then the, and the class to be derived from that. Okay? Because if you know, if there's a class C and you've got CI and then you have another class B that implements C, B implements CI, which doesn't sound right, right? So the interface is the more, more abstract thing. So it comes first in the naming, even though historically it might come later. Okay, so I'd recommend you derive things, derive class names from the interface. Okay, so this particular approach assumes that only one implementation of the interface will be created.